Good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Tim Lockheed. I am the executive director of the World Federation of Science Journalists, and welcome to our third presentation in a series that celebrates the honorees of this year's Letten Prize, which is uh, being awarded by Norway's Letten Foundation and the Young Academy of Norway to uh, promising young researchers working in innovative areas of science, technology, and the humanities. Um, the, uh, we're very pleased today to have Ramona Villaresa. Is that, uh, is that close enough, uh, Ramona? Vijay Rasa, correct. Thanks, Tim. Vijay Rasa, okay. Uh, Pakenham has probably practiced this more than I have. Uh, <laughs> she is going to be interviewed today by uh, a science journalist, Pakenham Amara. Uh, whom we are pleased to welcome as a member of the World Federation of Science Journalists. Pakenham, please take it away. All right, awesome. So Tim, I, I also want to add that Ramona is a senior lecturer of law at the University of Technology in Sydney, Australia, and a current research fellow at the Women's Leadership Institute in Australia. Um, and the, the fascinating thing that Ramona did, you know, among her many achievements is that she developed um, a tool called the Gender Legislative Index. And basically it's a method of measuring the effectiveness of gender laws, um, you know, across different countries um, in response to men's and women's different needs and interests and in line with their lived in experiences. Um, and although, like um, like we said in the introduction, it's 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 a tool that is created to advance uh, gender equality, um, and as as a way of setting a benchmark for gender specific laws, it could also be applied to other areas of the law. I mean, to most areas of the law. Um, and in fact, it has been applied to hundreds of laws across uh, the Philippines, uh, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, and Australia. Um, and today, this is mainly what we're here to talk about. Uh, but we're also going to talk about uh, Ramona's journey leading up to creating this tool. Um, so yeah, so before I kind of jump into GLI, um, which uh, is short for uh, the Gender Legislative Index and its genesis and how it actually works, um, I was curious about the journey that brought you to this unique point um, at the intersection of technology and gender law, uh, specifically women's rights law. Um, for instance, I know, Ramona, that you come from corporate um, before you shifted to international human rights law and you went to NYU. And I would personally love if we can provide some context uh, into that experience, work and otherwise, that led you on the path to want to transform laws in the innovative way that you're doing now. So if you can tell me a bit about this journey, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Pakina, for such a wonderful and rich introduction. Um, and I suppose NYU really was a turning point because before joining the University of Technology Sydney four and a half years ago, I was in civil society really for around a decade. Um, so I did leave corporate law in Sydney to do my master's in international law at NYU. And it was one of those very rich experiences, not just because of NYU being um, such a brilliant institution, but because I was really surrounded by um, international human rights lawyers who had expertise in human rights for working within the UN system and plenty of opportunities to work with people who had witnessed firsthand um, the potential of international human rights law and how to bridge that gap between the people uh, most affected by rights violations. After my time at NYU, or during my time at NYU, actually I, I had a chance to intern. I interned at the Center for Battered Women's Legal Services in New York and spent time working with women who were seeking asylum so they could stay in the US and not have to stay in abusive or violent relationships just to maintain their visa status. I completed my master's at NYU and went on to work at the International Center for Transitional Justice and the Center for Reproductive Rights, both sort of leading global human rights advocacy NGOs. So all of this really brought to me a sense of the power of in this case, particularly international law, to bring about change. I left New York though, and I went to work at the International Organization for Migration in Vietnam and Ukraine before heading the women's rights team at ActionAid International. So I was at ActionAid for six years. ActionAid is a global NGO that fights poverty worldwide and at the time was working in over 40 countries. So it was this incredible experience working on a global scale 
and, and meeting with hundreds of women, literally hundreds of women over that time. And I really got to see how much these women felt the law was not working for them, how rarely the law was designed with women in mind. You know, I met with women who lived on the floating villages of Cambodia and they would try to access reproductive health care in unregulated hospitals where there were two doctors servicing thousands of people or women who were living in the slums of Rio who were married to or, or partnered to drug lords. So they really had no recourse to the formal law enforcement if they were trying to escape domestic violence. I met with you know, women in the universities of Liberia who were effectively threatened and required to provide sex in exchange for better grades. So all of these women would tell these stories that showed the ineffectiveness of law, but I still left that with this sense that the law could do better with a, with a belief in, in the law. I've wanted to be a lawyer my entire life since I was as young as uh, 11 or 12 years old. So I still believe the law could do better, um, but I had the stories at hand to tell me the ways in which the law was really failing the women that the law was meant to really protect. Um, so in your opinion, what was the reason why the laws were failing women, you know, across the globe. So it, it, it's, it's not like it's one country or one culture. It's something that is pretty universal and pretty global. And if you talk to women, you know, whether it's in Egypt, Sri Lanka or the US, um, they generally share similar laws when it comes to, you know, laws, uh, local or uh, you know, national laws failing them. And I'm wondering, you know, as someone who doesn't come from law, as, as someone who comes from media or from a very different background, uh, why is that? And, and how fast or slow does laws evolve in general in response to people's uh, needs and experiences? I think that's a great question. And I, and I think it all hints at this global problem that is gender inequality. You know, if I'm asked, what is the biggest challenge today? I always say gender inequality. And it's not that I don't see the problems we face when it comes to you know, unex unexplained diseases and, and viruses or climate change. You know, there's many challenges that exist and face the world on a global scale. But women have been unequal, literally, for centuries. And this change process has been so slow around the world, incredibly slow. And it, it doesn't undermine or dismiss the progress that has been made or the women, in particular, the women's rights activists who fought for those changes. You know, there's been improvements in girls' education. There's been slow changes in women's labor force participation, but it still lags behind men. On a global scale, the World Bank reports women have a 50% labor force participation rate compared to 77% for men. And on average in 2018, the World Bank reported that only 20% of national parliaments were composed of women on average, 20%. So that's one in five parliamentarians will be a woman, which means four out of five parliamentarians, depending on your parliamentary structure, will be a man. And so, you know, global inequality is rife. And no matter how much money has been invested and how many systems have been created to measure equality, progress is incredibly slow. And I think the law is a big part of that problem. And, and, and really, to me, a lot of that is ex ex explained by how few women are in leadership and decision-making positions. So when you think about the law, you have people who draft the law, people who enforce the law, and people who judge the law. And so we know legal drafters are dominated by men. So in systems where if you have a parliamentary system and members of parliament propose legislation, if the majority of those members are men, the majority of the people proposing new laws, so new bills that will be enacted into law, are men. There are not enough women on the floor to debate and defend gender responsive legislation. So it's not being enacted or it gets watered down and isn't what the women's rights community and activists and advocates wanted that law to be in the first place. Then we have people enforcing the law, often police, um, and who are dominated by men and may not be trained to understand what is happening in a particular situation, domestic violence at home or, for, or other forms of, of violence, harassment on the street that women experience. And then you have judges who interpret the law in so many countries. And we also know that men dominate the judiciary. So just in the legal space alone, to me, part of the answer as to why the law has been so slow in being the gender responsive legislation it needs to be, the gender responsive legal system it needs to be, is because there are so few women having a voice in these spaces. When you look broader to the bigger question of gender equality, I think the, the lack of women in leadership positions as heads of states and governments and in parliaments and in influential ministries all explain why progress on gender equality nationally is so slow. 
But even when you look internationally, there's been no female United Nations Secretary General in the United Nations history. So from local levels to national levels to the global level, women are not occupying the kind of decision-making spaces where they need to be for a genuine and catalyzing shift in how we're responding to gender inequality. That's really interesting. So how does GLI actually work to improve the law? Where does it come in and what is the mechanism of it? So can we sort of make a little stop here and explain it in simple terms for people who are not legal experts or, or who do not come from, um, you know, backgrounds with um, expertise in law or um, the legislation? So what does it, how does it work? What uh, references is it drawing from? And um, how does it factor in human experience in its evaluation of certain laws? That's, that's a great question, but I'll take a step back first and just even explain what brought me to create the Gender Legislative Index specifically before I talk about the mechanisms of the GLI. So when I, when I set out to create this, what I was actually keen to do was measure what difference women leaders make when they're heads of state or heads of government. And in this particular case, what difference do women presidents make on the lives of fellow women? So this was actually my starting point. This was my initial project of interest. And I wanted to look at countries in Asia, but we know Asia has had this surprisingly high number of women presidents. I don't mean to classify Asia as homogenous given the great diversity in the region, but my focus was on the Philippines, Sri Lanka and Indonesia. And I wanted to look at the tenures of women presidents and, and to say, well, when they were in power, were more women-friendly laws enacted. And yet when I set out to do this, I couldn't find a tool to enable me to measure the gender responsiveness of the laws that were enacted when those women were in power. It simply didn't exist. Now, there are so many indices out there, we know many of them, that measure progress on gender equality, but none that would allow you to look at a specific law and evaluate specific provisions of that law and give that law an overall score in terms of is that law improving women's lives? Does it respond to gender specific needs and interests? And so I decided to create that tool. So that was the main impetus to get me started. And I don't think at that moment I could have imagined, you know, what I was about to create and its potential far beyond that application to women's leadership and, and the legacy of women. That particular legal legacy project will be published in my new book called The Woman President, uh, which will be published by Oxford University Press um, early next year, which is very exciting. And then when I set about to decide to develop the index, I mean, my starting point was to say, I don't think it's good enough to compare one country to another, but to look at what's the ultimate best standard women, um, we can apply to achieve the best laws for women. And as an international women's rights lawyer, my natural mind turns to international human rights law. So to me, those ultimate standards, albeit at times flawed, come from the UN human rights system. And in this case, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. So this is a United Nations Treaty, it came into force back in 1981, but I think what's unique about it is nearly every country in the world has signed up to it. So it has this whole host of international women's rights commitments. So I wanted to create an index to measure laws and I thought I'll turn to this convention. And I tore apart the convention, I deconstructed it, I coded it, I evaluated it and it's all the recommendations the committee that oversees that convention have made over a near 40 year period. And I came up with seven questions that I believe any legal drafter should ask of a law. So most indices require a set of questions or common sort of standards to be applied across them for fairness. And so my seven questions for the Gender Legislative Index came from CEDAW. And that I can, you can imagine was, took a considerable amount of time. So I had my seven questions and I had this sense of, what might be classified as gender responsive legislation or good laws on the one hand and gender regressive provisions on the other, the bad ones. And I have gender neutral and gender blind in between. But I would wanna make this extra point, which when I set out to develop the gender legislative index, what was really key to me was an index that measured legislation that we often think about from a gender perspective, like gender-based violence or reproductive health, but that could really measure any law from a women's rights perspective, whether it was a tax law or a financial services law or a mining law, because to me, gender is relevant for everything. And so these seven questions and this sort of um, scale from gender regressive at one end and gender responsive on the other, open the possibility to evaluating legislation across a very broad spectrum in terms of how well would that law advance women's rights. But 
uh, the, 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 the index uses machine learning and AI technology, and this is something that I wanted to kind of stop at. First, what inspired it? Because I understand that, you know, I understand that what inspired it in the sense that you wanted to improve the laws and, and align them with, you know, women's, men's, families' needs. Um, so I get that concept, but I'm sort of a little baffled how, um, you know, the idea came to kind of lean on machine learning or AI to make this happen or to evaluate these laws. Uh, because to someone like me, it feels like, you know, the law and the AI um, world are like two different worlds running in parallel and they rarely ever meet, but somehow you kind of found a way to bridge them. And I wanted to talk about that. Like how does machine learning come in and what inspired you to look, um, you know, at um, nascent technology or, or actually it's kind of developed technology by now, but you know, but this form of technology in particular to kind of help you with your problem of evaluating these laws in a systematic and um, in, a, in a neutral form. And that's such a great point because I think AI and certainly human rights are often seen as diametrically opposed. If anything, most of the debates around AI these days are what are the human rights implications of AI um, making determinations about people's lives and accessing people's data. So really, it, it's such an um, important point you raise. Well, I was at a stage where I had these seven questions that I, that I had derived from the convention and I had my scale. And really here, I had to stretch beyond my own discipline, which is obviously law, because I knew I needed to create something more workable, a workable index that could store data, that could be accessible, and that could, be, that could really reach scale. You know, I was one lawyer sitting in an academic's office evaluating legislation, and that would only go so far in terms of making a real dent in gender inequality. And so I had to look to collaborators. And so my first step, and I have to say, it was many more steps in between because finding collaborators in the academic world can be um, adventurous, it can be time consuming, it can be challenging, and you can easily rock on the knock, knock on the wrong doors. But I eventually knocked on the right one, and that was Rapido Social. So Rapido Social sit in the Faculty of Engineering and Information Technology here at UTS, and they do what are called low bono or pro bono projects, so at cost or for free. And so I really had to convince Rapido that this was a worthwhile project, that they had to be part of this possibility of, you know, a new technologically based legal tool to advance equality. And so I got them on board and Rapido were able to take my index and my concepts and work with me to create a workable index. And so the way the index functions is that human evaluators, myself included, we sit in a room and we literally comb through legislation. We read every provision of every law and we evaluate those provisions as either regressive on the one end or responsive on the other against those seven questions. And then us as human evaluators, we give an overall score for a law. But as humans, we bring a lot of bias. You know, are you a woman? That brings bias. Are you a person of color? Are you a native English speaker or a non-native English speaker? Are you married? Are you unmarried? Are you a migrant? Many women's rights experts have more expertise in some areas like gender-based violence over tax. So all of these adds to the bias behind our evaluation. So as human evaluators, we evaluated the laws and, and the AI really served two purposes. With these seven questions scaled on a, on a scale from regressive to responsive and the overall score for a law, given by each human evaluator, you can imagine how much data existed to evaluate just each single law. So that was the first challenge we had to overcome. And the second challenge is most people who use an index want to see a headline, good law, bad law, very bad law, almost perfect. You know, that's a natural inclination because it's too much data to compute. We want to be able to take something away. And we want to be able to compare different laws. And so this is why AI provided a solution. So I then um, worked with some data analysts, particularly at the Connected Intelligence Center here at UTS. And we sat down and combed through the options and we decided the best option was a decision tree that would add up all those seven evaluations that gave a final score from each human evaluator and create a computer generated algorithm that would score the law overall for us because easily two evaluators or three evaluators or four evaluators might disagree on an overall score, but an algorithm with AI capacity has the potential to compute all of those little pieces of chains that each human evaluator has entered into the system 
and come up with that overall score for the law. On top of which we taught the algorithm, which, you which is typical in data science, using snippets of the data. And the algorithm treated a law evaluated in relation to tax, the same as a law evaluated in relation to reproductive health, the same way as it would a law evaluated in relation to financial services. So it had an element of reducing some of the human bias that existed when giving that overall score for the law. So what we ended up with was this sort of um, beautiful and quite unique, I believe, marriage between law, technology and data science, um, which I think is what makes the Gender Legislative Index you know, quite cutting edge, but also really exciting as a new way to try to fight gender inequality. And I'm trying to imagine like the amount of information and data that you had to feed the models in order to um, get reliable results. Um, and it must be really huge. So how long did it take you to build the algorithm, uh, train the model and test them? Um, you know, I think it's, when I reflect on the pilot period, in some ways it was relatively short. You know, we piloted the whole exercise almost in a nine month to one year period. But at the same time, it was sort of a very intense nine to 12 months with a lot of hands on board. So there were at some stages, four human evaluators, two software engineers, a data scientist, you know, myself overseeing the entire project as well and project manager. So there was just sort of multiple elements. We added in um, UX, user experience component. When we um, then worked on, the, on the, the website itself to make the data more accessible and understandable by users, depending on their expertise. Um, so, you know, a relatively short period of time, yet at the same time, a really intense one. Um, the, you know, there was one key component of the Gender Legislative Index, which I haven't talked about, which is when an evaluator evaluates a law, they need a context. They can't just have seven questions and a scale. They need to understand that area of law. So, for example, the first question of the seven is, does the law guarantee access to accessible, affordable, available and acceptable services? It's very UN human rights language, available, acceptable, affordable services. But what a service will look like in relation to gender-based violence, where it might be about access to shelters or free legal aid, is very different from a service in the reproductive health sector, where it might be about um, non-discriminatory services, including if you're a teenager trying to access contraception. And that's very different from a service in the financial services sector, which might be about mobile banking so that women living in rural communities can access banks or can access you know, much more affordable credit when we know women often um, have very unaffordable credit put forward to them. And so the very first step before even getting the evaluator in the room was to build a database of benchmarks or standards. So the human evaluators would have the seven questions and the scales, but also a set of criteria against which to think through, does this law really make women's lives better or not? Does this law meet international standards? So that was a whole other exercise before even this piloting period where around you know, myself and, and, and seven or so research assistants worked together to comb through international human rights conventions, international labor organization conventions, treaties, to come up with these benchmarks to give meaning for evaluators to, to make you know, evidence-based and sound decisions when evaluating the law in the first place. And I think what's really exciting is the Gender Legislative Index makes all of those benchmarks publicly available. They're relevant regardless of which country you come from, even if your laws haven't been evaluated. And pieced together, they can tell a legislator, this is what a good law should look like. You know, if, if there's time, I can tell you, you know, in the field of labour law, the benchmarks say things like women should have access to union representation. They should have access to union leadership. They should have specific access to vocational training in areas where they're often excluded. The workplace should promote equality. There should be no discrimination in pay. There should be no discrimination in promotions. There should be access to complaints for sexual harassment. There should be um, appeal mechanisms if those complaint mechanisms don't work. So you can imagine, you know, for each area of law, we're talking over 50 benchmarks that piece together, explain or, or illustrate the way the law should function at its optimum. So if you have a legislator out there who says, you know, I want to pass laws that work well for women, I want to do better. These benchmarks are sort of your, your blueprint to get you there very easily for those um, willing and dedicated you know, legislators out there who, who want the law to work more effectively. And that's you know, even for the unevaluated countries. So you've already applied uh, JLI to laws across four different countries. 
Uh, did any patterns emerge or stand out when you started applying GLI in the wild? Like either, um, you know, a surprising um, a result or observation or, or, or a consistent one, regardless of whether GLI was applied in Indonesia or in Australia, for instance? Mm -hmm. I suppose I'll start with a consistent pattern, which is really why I created the Gender Legislative Index in the first place. And I can give you a concrete example. The Gender Legislative Index has evaluated three laws from the Philippines, Indonesia, and Sri Lanka, all on domestic violence. And you know, for some largely unexplained reason, all three countries enacted domestic violence laws right in the same time period. And I haven't really been able to find an international justification for it. Was it the MDGs plus five? Was it that the countries had advocates who were meeting together and sharing knowledge? But the GLI has evaluated the law, those three laws. And, you know, really clearly the Philippines stands out in front. And the Indonesian and Sri Lankan laws lag behind. And there's various reasons for this. So in the really great part about the Gender Legislative Index, it can, it can highlight those countries that are doing well. And it can show countries like Indonesia, this is what you might need to do to reform your particular law on gender-based violence. Um, and that's really what I wanted to set out to do. And it's a big challenge in this space. You know, I, I know I've been to all three countries and that was an added um, element to the creation of the Gender Legislative Index. In the pre-COVID days when we could still freely travel, I had the privilege of going to all three countries and meeting with activists and legislators and interviewing them. And, you know, I know a lot of the Filipino women's rights advocates don't want the Philippines to be branded as a, as a great country when it comes to legislation because they're still advocating for more reform. They want to see further changes. But the data shows, you know, relative to the other two countries, the Philippines stands out. So I think the first pattern is, yes, it, it proves the index can highlight good performers and show some of the weaker performers the ways in which they can improve and get better. I think the second thing I would say is that it's not so easy to say this is a good law and this is a bad law. I think it's really clear that bad provisions, gender regressive provisions can exist in good laws. And even gender responsive provisions can be buried somewhere in a, in a gender regressive or, or poor performing law. And so it's not often clear cut. And I think it's particularly key to look out for those you know, regressive provisions in good laws because they might stop the law from having the intended effect. So, for example, Sri Lanka has a law that is trying to address violence against students and educators in the tertiary education system. But there are no protections for the women who complain for their confidentiality. And that's been a major bar for a lot of women coming forward and saying, look, I've suffered harassment or violence in, in the education sector. And so that, that, that lack of that provision is really undermining the law's effectiveness. Sri Lanka also has a domestic violence law where, where judges can order mediation even when there's been accusations of violence and a woman wants to separate from her partner. And that completely goes against international standards, sort of court ordered mediation in context of violence. And so that provision, again, really undermines the ability of women to trust the justice system to do right by them. I think the third finding, and I think this is what was so exciting about including a straight in the data set, is we often have some of those really classically high-performing countries when it comes to gender equality. You know, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, New Zealand has really risen in the ranks. Sadly, Australia is not one of them, but we are one of the richest countries, the 10th richest country among the OECD nations. And there certainly cannot be said to be a natural correlation between wealth and strong laws on gender equality, because Australia falls short in many respects, and in some respects, even shorter, falls further down than Indonesia or the Philippines or, or Sri Lanka. So it's, I think it really challenges the assumption that global South countries perform poorly and global North countries perform well. And I think it's important to remind ourselves that countries across the spectrum can always improve what they're doing in this global fight for gender equality. So for example, Australia offers maternity leave provisions that are weaker than what are offered in the Philippines. We offer very few weeks of paid leave. Uh, we have a system that encourages women to be the primary carers and not an equal sharing of responsibility between men and women. And so for such a wealthy country and such a de developed country, it doesn't natu naturally mean that our laws are going to be gender responsive. They may be drafted better and there may be strong cohesion within the law from a technical legal perspective, but it doesn't mean our laws are necessarily going to advance women's rights more than in countries in the global south. So how can we 
like based on all what you're saying, how can we start sharing or streamlining this tool in other countries, say, um, you know, in Africa or the Middle East or the US or China, um, you know, while preserving the nuances, you know, of, of evaluating of how, you know, the system evaluates these laws while building trust in it um, and also training, you know, legislators or advocates to use it. Um, and, and is there a way to kind of use the comparative aspect of the tool in order to kind of improve laws better, especially if, you know, two countries have very similar, you know, environments or settings or references for their laws? Is there a way to kind of utilize the fact that it, it, it can, um, you know, work across different countries and there is a comparative aspect that perhaps might come useful, um, you know, in amending or changing or, uh, you know, improving laws? Well, I'll start by saying, you know, it is a public tool and the benchmarks are public and the, the seven questions that every evaluator, I believe, should be asking when they're writing a law, they're all publicly available. And I think that's, that's a great starting point. You know, the resource is there. I have Google Analytics on the Gender Legislative Index and I'm surprised at different moments in time, the number of people from different countries, Mexico, Turkey, Canada, who are visiting the index. Um, in one particular month, there were multiple, near the hundreds, visitors from Turkey. And I thought, what is happening in Turkey right now? Is there a conference, a women's rights event? Is a particular law being drafting, drafted that is encouraging all those people from Turkey to visit the site? So I think there's a, that it's slowly getting visibility and I hope more and more people see it because it's got so much potential alone in, in what's there. In terms of um, the, your question around countries um, that, that borrow from each other. I think this is an excellent point because one of the things I've noticed in all my period of advocacy is that countries are very comfortable learning from near neighbours. And I use the term neighbours loosely to mean you know, geographic neighbours, but also countries where they feel some sort of affiliation or relationship. When I was meeting with Indonesian advocates, they often said to me, oh, we actually had an, a women's rights expert from Turkey and Malaysia come here and help us draft our, our law on gender-based violence because of obviously the countries that are Muslim countries and they, they feel that there's a resonance um, and a relevance in looking and borrowing lessons and ideas for Indonesia, Malaysia and, and Turkey. So I think the more countries that are in the database, the more countries whose laws are evaluated, the more countries can start to download evaluations of the good laws and, and utilize them. And when I mentioned earlier that we spent quite a bit of time working on the user experience, my number one priority was searchability because I wanted people who come to the Gender Legislative Index to be able to look for laws and, and find the highest ranking law and to be able to search by country and by area of law to get out the laws and download them and, and take them away with them that were really performing well. Because it's, it's not, it may, it may be some time off before every law around the world that's been considered really relevant is evaluated in the system. But what there is now are good examples that can be taken um, by countries that see a resonance from the countries in the system and, and use to advance or improve their laws and, and push for law reform domestically. And, um, and this is something that we discussed earlier when we were prepping together uh, for this interview. And it's, it's, it's really interesting the more that I think about it, how GLI, you know, um, as it's being used in different settings, the kind of challenges that might arise. So I'm thinking of, you know, culture-based laws, uh, religion-based laws uh, that may or may not fare well according to the benchmarks set by GLI. So whether it's gender violence or, you know, burden of care for women at home or discrimination at work or any other uh, type of problematic law uh, or a portion of a law, um, it may or may not trigger, uh, trigger conflict, but um, whether or not it does trigger the conflict, it will probably, um, you know, make some sensitivities arise or create stronger hostile reactions or create very difficult conversations around laws that may have been in effect for decades. And that perhaps according to international standards are um, flawed or not effective or would need to be re-evaluated or maybe overhauled altogether. But to a lot of people, these laws maybe reflect their beliefs, their cultures, um, you know, their religions uh, and, you know, th their lifestyles. And don't 
PLI is an incredibly useful tool, but I'm trying to imagine that depending on the setting, it may be iconoclastic or revolutionary even. So in practice, how do you how do you plan on guiding legislators and and advocates or whoever uses JLI, you know, to to navigate these murky waters and and deal with these challenges to make it um, a more acceptable tool? Um, well, I hope it's um, revolutionary, Pakina. I think that's exactly where we where we need to be pushing the boundaries and and pushing countries to reach the highest standard they can in what they're doing for women. But I suppose I would start by saying, you know, I think as someone who came, comes from a very privileged background, I'm also conscious of diversity, even within you know, the very enormous category of women. You know, I have um, parents who are migrants to Australia, who were themselves born in Sri Lanka, born in Malaysia, and my grandparents are from Sri Lanka. So I'm first generation Australian, and I think it's important to have a consciousness of religious and cultural diversity and linguistic diversity, and that the Gender Legislative Index has to acknowledge that you know, global diversity around the world and trying to create a benchmark or, st or standard to evaluate legislation. But I think this is also what's so key about the index being based on international women's rights law and being based on a treaty that almost every country in the world has signed up to. The governments in those countries have said yes to those commitments. It's not something that is imposed by the Gender Legislative Index or myself. And I think the biggest part of that is every country is held to the same standard. You know, we're not treating one country any harsher than another, but every country is being asked to make those global commitments. So then the natural question to ask is, well, what do those commitments mean to women in those countries? Well, as someone, again, who's been very privileged to spend many annual years in New York City, at, a, at the Commission on the Status of Women. It's one of the biggest gatherings, or at least was before COVID, of women um, at a UN event. Women come from around the world to lobby their governments to get the right language in the document that emerges at the end of that space. And the women advocates from every country believe in and utilise the UN system, including the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And it's not flawless. It has its flaws and it has its limitations, but it is a multi-dimensional, detailed, rich convention that has existed in the world for nearly 40 years that forms the foundations of the Gender Legislative Index. So we're telling these countries, we're holding you to the standard that your governments signed up to all those years ago, and it's no different from country X, Y, or Z. I think what's also really nice about the countries that have been piloted in the index is they are so diverse. You know, Indonesia is um, a majority Muslim country, the Philippines majority Catholic and Sri Lanka majority Buddhist. And while these three Asian countries share a lot of commonalities in terms of, you know, colonial histories and, and all being Asian countries, they are extremely diverse. And yet they show the GLI still can work as a successful tool in their country context, including evaluating laws that have been translated in this case from Indonesia to English. And so I think, you know, the, the choice of countries and what we have now shows that the limitations or hesitancies can, can be justified and overcome. And sort of the potential in front of us is really quite vast. I completely agree. And I think this tool has amazing potential, but before I talk more about it, and I do have a couple of more questions and I also wanna talk about your upcoming book, um, which is great timing because I know it's coming at the end of this month on the 23rd of July. Um, so I want to talk about that, but before um, I, we do a deep dive into the book and what inspired it, I want to see if anyone, you know, with us in the panel um, who wants to kind of chime in or ask a question maybe because so far I've been hogging the conversation and I don't think it's entirely fair um, because I know that a lot of people might also want to share from their own background and experience when it comes to gender laws. Um, it's something that, you know, everyone has something to say about because of their lived in experiences and because of the nature of the laws in their own country. So maybe Elizabeth or Tim or anyone else would like to, you know, um, comment or ask you a question. Um, this is a great time to do so if you have any questions. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for uh, everything you spoken around I think it's uh, so fascinating and so interesting and it's a great opportunity to we I think a lot of us are aware of a lot of these things but we don't really know the facts and 
uh, and all of that. So this is incredibly interesting. And I was just reflecting on a lot of things that you've said, but I will just uh, start with this um, because we're talking also about you know having more women in positions of leadership, and that's something I feel myself very strongly uh, about, and I try to also do my best not only to involve myself in those positions as scary as it, it can be um but sometimes you know it's also tricky because you know having a woman per se, a woman per se is not necessarily something that is going to have a good effect on women right we we know that there are uh women in leadership positions that actually have very conservative views and that are not really working for women or for the majority of women with or all of the degrees of um life experiences and uh, I was mentioning before I come I come from Spain um, and even though I'm not as involved in the politics of the country now that I've been away for so many years um, you know in the my my hometown in Madrid we've actually had uh, many um, presidents of the community that have actually a lot of power that have been female presidents and they haven't really been um, you know the kind of female uh, leadership that you would expect uh, to work for women and, and to work for diversity and not just for, you know, the very sort of small group of, of uh, white privileged women that come from a specific uh, class. So I, I was just wondering what your thoughts are uh, about this. Um, thank you so much, Elizabeth, both for joining and for the question. So, you know, I wear my two hats, my international women's rights lawyer hat and then my politics passion hat. Um, which is what's leading to the book that's not the one we're about to talk about, but the one that's coming out next year, The Woman President. And I think my book, without um, giving away too much, speaks to a lot of what you've just said, which is, you know, is, is there a valid assumption that women in leadership will necessarily do more for women? And I think the data is very mixed. And there has been a strong effort, particularly to evaluate legislators, to, to consider what issues are brought to the table when there are more women legislators. And there is research in different countries that shows a tendency towards more laws on health and education and sort of what are called women, women friendly bills when women are in the legislature. And there's so many more um, factors that need to be considered and the data is so limited, often because it's hard to compare across countries and because there are so few women in these spaces. But there is something also said about if what is the number of women you need in that space to make it easier for women in those decision-making um, positions to not be labelled as the woman bringing up women's issues? And I think that's a challenge so often for women who, who do finally make it in. There are so few fellow women around them in, a, in such a patriarchal, male-dominated space that it's often hard. It's not, I'm not trying to excuse, but it can be often hard to then bring up about women's issues without being labelled a particular way, either too soft or too women focused, not economic enough. I mean, the list goes on and, and the blame is both with the nature of politics and the nature of the media. And I'm working on a project in a separate project altogether in Indonesia and Sri Lanka. And was at a conference in Canberra uh, a few weeks ago. And it strikes me how much the similarities between the obstacles for women in politics in Australia as there are in Sri Lanka. It's remarkable how such two different countries have such two, you know, just common experiences. But in the women president, what I also find is that when women are in power, it's important to consider what are the factors that might enable them to do more for women. So how have they gotten into power? Have they entered into that position of power, for example, off the back of the church? who then can control the agenda and can really create a barrier to reproductive health reforms? Or have they managed to get through, um, you know, off the, the back of um, a male relative, which is not necessarily always a barrier to them bringing up women-friendly issues? You know, one other thing that really comes to mind for me is that my research is showing when women make it to the office of president, there seems to be greater opportunities for the women's movement to push through the passage of legislation that until then hadn't passed and in a much faster pace than when men are in power. And it may not be that the woman president necessarily supports that law, but certainly the power of the women vote, the, women, the assumption that women will vote for the woman president and the power to use that means the women's movement have more potential open doors to push through legislation that ends up women friendly. But then obviously at the end of the day, and I think being 
um, someone who sounds like an advocate, we have to say, well, we need more women in these positions purely as a question of parity, purely as a question of equity, regardless of whether they're there to fight for women-friendly laws, because women need to see women in leadership positions to yeah. want to get for themselves. Yeah, and I agree with that. I'm, I mean, I'm a, full, a, a full supporter of the fact that you can become what you can't see. Uh, and that's also why it's important to have uh, a range of diversity in, in any kind of positions that you know that there is no limits to what you can be, what you can become and what you can do uh, for your society. And at the same time, you know, it's, it's also what I also uh, say to people sometimes that, you know, not because you're a woman, you're necessarily going to fight for things that are uh, for women. And, and, you know, we are individual uh, people and we have our own ideologies and our own uh, experiences and the fact that you have a more, you know, equal representation of different groups that just means that there's going to be different appearance within those groups as well, but then mm. it is not as monolithic as, as you mm. can expect. And then it also raises this, you know, really fundamental question, which is what counts as for women? Mm. Because as, as half the population who function in the same society as men, everything affects us in the world around us. The tax system, environmental laws, whether we mine or not, corruption practices, and yet these are spaces which are often not considered um, as relevant to women. So we as advocates don't have as much expertise in those spaces. We're rarely at the decision-making table. And when gender is, is discussed, it's treated as an add-on, not a core part of the conversation. It can really frame the whole debate. And so I think it's also about challenging what counts as a women's issue. So that when legislators are coming to the table, they bring that gender perspective to everything. And as we as advocates call for that gender responsiveness, in a much broader range of issues than what we have traditionally tended to focus on. I know that Tim also had a question. Um, he mentioned in the chat that he also wanted to chime in. So Tim, you wanna go ahead? You, you've inspired me, Ramona. I wasn't gonna get involved. I know I should be the neutral moderator here, but I, I'm, I'm really intrigued. And this is going to sound like a non sequitur, but um, bear with me. So listening to this conversation reminds me of uh, a story I did a long time ago about environmental legislation in the 1970s. And, and as we know, um, you know, prior to that, and, uh, you know, the uh, Rachel Carson, people like that, there, the mentality around protecting the environment was seen to be, yeah, it's nice to have a clean environment, but we've got better things to do. And it wasn't a priority. You put the factory where you put the factory, you don't worry about the noise, you don't worry about chemicals, you don't worry about any of that. And that all changed in the 1970s. And um, in the 1990s, there were a number of longitudinal studies about the kind of global impact that these changes in laws had in countries that really took it seriously. And um, admittedly, correlation is not causation, but uh, in countries that really embraced this, you had uh, all the markers of improved health, uh, improved economic output, um, all kinds of social cohesion came together. Um, so I would like to ask you, uh, you know, and if this goes beyond the scope of, of what you've been talking about, just let me know. But, you know, what you're talking about here is a similar kind of fundamental alteration in the way the legal system uh, respects half the population. And, um, can you foresee those same kinds of impacts, whether they're economic or social, that would benefit countries that really embrace this? You know, things that might not be immediately obvious in the way that people in the 1970s just wanted to clean up a place. They weren't selling it on the basis of, oh, this will improve our economic output. Uh, can you see similar changes 20, 30, 50 years from now in the places that are really embracing the changes you're talking about? So I'd say three things, and I think it very much fits within the gender legislative index. And the first thing I'd say is that, you know, a lot of the index is underpinned by feminist principles, which are also equally tied in with voice, participation, um, respect for the environment, um, well-being, sustainability of both the human and the environmental world. And so I think if we pursue these, um, the gender legislative index and gender responsive legislation underpinned with those feminist values, then surely society as a whole will benefit environmentally and you know, in terms of human well-being generally. The second thing I would say that if you did want tangible concrete benefits, you know, there, there is data out there to show it. And I think that's what makes this an exciting turning point 
you know, many, many feminists and women's rights activists shy away from saying there's an economic benefit from pursuing gender equality. But sometimes you need to show that because that's what decision makers want to hear. And there is an economic benefit from pursuing gender equality. You know, in countries where they have better um, shared parental leave, for example, if you have parental leave where there's an equal proportion to either partner, whether same sex partners or from different sexes, an equal proportion of paid leave that cannot be transferred between them, you'll get people back into the workforce, particularly people being often women, back into the workforce faster at the same levels and for the same hours as before having children, which increases productivity just from the increased labour force participation rate of women. Increased productivity means economic benefits. So, you know, the data is there to tell the less convinced that there is benefit from pursuing gender responsive legislation. But your question, Tim, raises to me a much bigger, perhaps philosophical question. So when I was at this event in Canberra, the event was called the 50-50 Symposium. So naturally, a, a, a symposium about getting 50% of positions you know, occupied by women, women sharing 50% of the power in the law, 50% of economic power and political power. And besides the fact that we were all grappling by day two with the fact that not everybody identifies as being either one part or another part of that 50%, that there are people in the, who don't identify as being either men or women, we still started asking ourselves, are we asking the right question? Was 50-50 and gender equality the right question for this symposium? Because surely we need something more transformational, something much bigger, that sees an intersection of respect for women, people, minorities, the environment, the indigenous owners of the land on which we stand. So there's much bigger questions. And I think it was very hard for people in the room to admit that because we've been gender equality advocates most of our lives and so used to waving the gender flag. But I think we quickly realized maybe that was a wrong flag and we needed to be getting together and and looking in a much more transformational and visionary way for a more equal society in, in a bigger sense of the word equal. Um, and so I think that is a question to ask ourselves. I don't think it at all undermines the gender legislative index, but quite the opposite. It reminds us that we always need to be legislating by keeping in mind everybody who's affected by a law. You know, not be, to be quite frank, the white, men whose mindset the law is often based on, but people who are of you know, multiple races, linguistic backgrounds, religious backgrounds, however you identify in terms of your sexual orientation and your gender identity or your gender, because you know, there's a huge proportion of the population who are ignored altogether by legal drafters. The law is not written in mind for so many of the people governed by the law. And so I think the Gender Legislative Index really brings to mind that question of how can we rethink the way we, we draft legislation um, in countries around the world? So Ramona, uh, if I may, you know, jump in. Um, I'm thinking of, um, you know, like you said, the people who are affected by these laws. And um, I'm thinking in, you know, in, in, in a regional context, you know, in, in you know, in, in the region that I come from, it's pretty hard to kind of push for change in laws or improvement in laws, especially if uh, people are a are not aware of you know how these laws are affecting. I mean, of the specifics of, of how these laws are affecting them, um, but also um, because of lack of participation or um, or lack of awareness or you know or. A general feeling of helplessness you know the idea that you know it's just it's almost sometimes it feels like the laws are set in stone that it's so mm. hard to kind of you know start improving or you don't even know where to begin and i'm thinking you know a lot of legislators in many countries might be resistant to that kind of change so it's not uh, it's, it's not just that the tool has to be available but you know there has to be will to change as well and to review the laws and revise the laws and that takes a lot of work and that takes a lot of resources too and i'm thinking how can we make a place for a tool like gli in a space like that should it say be used for awareness purposes or for advocacy in the sense that you know uh, instead of pushing legislators to use it as a tool to kind of improve laws, then maybe we can focus on another area where we can 
um, you know, engage, um, you know, other participants, because it takes a village to change not just the people who are involved in the law, but maybe engage participants like media, like the people who are affected by the laws and, um, you know, other sectors of society to kind of use this tool to kind of push for change. Sorry, does Absolutely. this question make sense? No, it's, it completely makes sense. Absolutely. The Gender Legislative Index has to be used as a tool for advocacy. And I think, you know, when I started the conversation, I was talking about how slow progress has been globally on gender equality. Yes, we've got some much, we're in a much better place. You know, women can vote in every country around the world now. Saudi Arabia, you know, joined the ranks in 2015. But of course, women should be able to vote in every country around the world. So, you know, we, we are nowhere near where we need to be. But there's a much stronger gender consciousness including among the media, including among um, people who write school curriculums, which is really where change can happen if we get into the education system and educate young people today differently. And I think the Gender Legislative Index definitely can be part of that because it can change the conversation. So it doesn't, it doesn't just have to be used by legislators and legal advocates and um, women's rights NGOs seeking law reform, but it can be used as a tool to help people re rethink about the law. And, and, you know, I think the law in many countries is set up in a way that seems, as you said, set in concrete and very um, untouchable by many people. It's interesting the way you frame that because there's a law in Australia that was evaluated, which is the Work, Health and Safety Act. And I reviewed this law and it's really about, it defines safety as both physical and psychological. And so the inclusion of psychological safety really opens the door. But the whole legislation, the whole piece of legislation is focused on accidents in the workplace, spillages on the factory floor, physical um, safety. So it doesn't talk about sexual harassment at work or any of the other psychological harms that will happen in the workplace or reference other laws that do. And I evaluated and I thought, oh, that's really strange. Am I missing something here? And I reread the law and I reread it. And even after completing the evaluation, I started doubting myself. Am I understanding this law incorrectly? And I came to the conclusion, I'm not understanding the law incorrectly. The legislators who sat in the room to draft it simply just had a very narrow focus, but they didn't need to have that narrow focus. They could have had a different mindset. They could have included other psychological harms in the workplace in the definition of safety. There was nothing stopping them from doing that. They simply chose not to. And I don't think they necessarily didn't want to. It just wasn't part of the conversation. It wasn't even part of their mindset. And I think the gender legislative index and conversations like these have the potential to change the way people think about the law or the way the law should work and the possibility behind the law, whether they're legislative drafters or people who are affected by the law. And I think if we have those conversations, it makes the law seem less intimidating and far out of reach and far more relevant and people can better understand the way the law is shaping their lives, but the way the law doesn't need to be the way that it so often is. So speaking of widening the scope and being in conversations with others, um, you know, about how, um, you know, loss can improve. I know that, you know, your upcoming book, um, you know, like I said, it's coming later this month. Uh, it's on international women's rights law and gender responsive legislation. And I know that in order to create the infrastructure for this book, you were in conversation yourself with a lot of gender equality experts across different areas of laws and from all backgrounds and from different countries. And you discussed, you know, uh, different types of laws from gender-based, um, you know, laws that look at gender-based violence to laws that address corruption or taxation or the environment. And I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, how did this experience kind of change you or change your perspective? Of, um, of, of, of how, of what we need in order to, um, you know, move further or use something like GLI to kind of um, really create the change that we want to create. So if you can just, you know, tell me about your experience putting your heads together with like-minded scholars about advancing gender equality. Sure. So, um, you know, the, 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 book really, or the symposium that led to the book was thanks to the Academy of the Social Sciences of Australia. And together with their funding, I was able to bring together these, you know, global experts to talk about gender equality. And, you know, our book, which um, just arrived in the mail yesterday, um, is out in July, and we'll be hosting a launch, uh, a webinar um, on the 29th of July as well. 
And, and as I said, you know, I think what's really exciting about the book is it, it brings this gender lens across a huge diversity of issues. You know, so there's a, there's this, um, analysis of labor laws, corruption laws, environmental laws, all from a gender perspective, which is so rare because, you know, even in my own history, working career, working um, as a women's rights advocate, we tend to really focus on those areas of law like gender-based violence or, or reproductive health. And we don't often look at gender in these other spaces. I think in terms of the lesson, I, it, I think pulling everybody together, you know, on the one hand, you can have this approach where you work slowly to reform existing laws. And I think that is a valid approach. We have, you know, most countries today already have their, their legal systems very strongly set in paper. Few countries have a blank paper to start with. You'd have to be a new nation. We know how rare new nations are to be drafting a full set of new laws. So many legal advocates in this space work slowly to, to improve the law. And I think in, in bringing this book together, we often have these debates around, is the goal to improve what we have and to work with the system we have? Or do you want to burn down the master's house altogether because the master's tools can never be used to, to fix the master's house, drawing from you know, civil rights advocates, or Audrey Lord. And I think we found ourselves often swaying between those two positions. You know, at times we thought, no, we need something more transformational. People need to think entirely differently about the legal system and about writing laws to really get gender responsive outcomes. And at other times we thought, okay, let's work. Let's extend the number of weeks of paid parental leave. Let's better train the police so they are identifying you know, women victims of gender-based violence. Let's get more women in the international um, debates so that they can make sure new treaties really incorporate a gender perspective. Uh, and I think that's a, you know, an ongoing challenge because at the end of the day, the legal system is so, as you say, firm and concrete. And so we need to find those right moments when we work with the system we have to improve the laws for women. And those other moments where we really push to burn down the house altogether and seek something far more transformational to really hasten the progress that we're making um, to fight gender inequality. And sort of those sorts of um, themes come out in the book. So I, no, I was just saying that the work that you're doing is incredible. And I'm, I'm personally th thoroughly impressed, uh, you know, by the amount of effort that was put into it and, you know, the potential of it as well. Um, and before I ask anyone else if they have more questions, I just want to say that Ramona's book will be available uh, from Taylor and Francis on the 23rd of July. Uh, it's called International Women's Rights Law and Gender Equality, Making the Law Work for Women. And you can actually pre-order it right now, and it will arrive on the 23rd. Uh, I personally can't wait to read it and to kind of dive into this more because we can talk about this forever. I mean, um, the amount of potential, like I said, for GLI and for improving gender laws across the world. It's almost, you know, how um, how flawed gender laws are. It's almost like the great equalizer, you know, maybe after death and taxes. But, you know, it's one of those things that is uh, that is there regardless of, you know, the context of, of the setting or of where you are. I mean, um, it's, there is always even room for improvement, even for countries who have made a lot of advancement on women's rights laws and gender laws. Um, and so, I mean, uh, on behalf of many women, I'm, I'm grateful for uh, women like you who are making, you know, um, amazing, um, you know, amazing work, but also, you know, using cutting edge technology to kind of make it more accessible and make it more streamlined and make it more global. Um, so I, I'm not sure if Tim or Elizabeth or anyone else want to chime in or have any more uh, questions or comments uh, before we wrap up. But if you do, I mean, feel free to jump in. I just want to thank you again for uh, for this opportunity. It was really great to to listen to you and to be able to chat with you. And I really look forward now to ordering your book. So <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and to. Um, everyone who joined to Pakinam for facilitating, you know, this really rich conversation, but particularly thank you to the Letton Prize Committee, um, to the Young Academy of Norway, um, and to the World Federation of Science Journalists. It's, it's such a privilege to be named runner-up um, and just to be associated with the prize and, and with all of these great institutions. So a huge thank you for, for the honour.